So this is an introduction video to Valda heart diseases and I'll be trying to explain you the must know things in Valda heart diseases, the basics and all the things you need to know to understand my upcoming videos on individual valvular heart diseases okay so make sure to watch this video till the end and I've also uh, explained the basic mechanisms of murmurs uh, in the various valvular heart diseases in this video and much detail on uh, the murmurs in valvular heart diseases uh, will be explained in my upcoming videos on individual valvular heart diseases so if you want to watch uh, more of my videos make sure to hit the subscribe button and the bell icon next to it right now so that you'll not miss out any of my upcoming videos okay and also don't forget to check out these merch which are designed by merch my, uh, designed by myself and these are actually available in various colors the link is in the description of this video okay it'd be very nice if you consider buying any of these so first the valves uh, wherever they are present in the body the main function of the valve is to provide unidirectional flow of blood okay have this in mind when the valves cannot do this function they become incompetent and the various valvular lesions happen okay so let's see about um, the valves in detail first let's discuss some basics okay so uh, what are these valves these valves are present between the atria and the ventricles okay so these vent these valves are called as atrioventricular valves as you can see here the atrioventricular valve on the left side uh, which is between the left atrium and the left ventricle has uh, two leaflets so um, this valve is called as bicuspid valve and you also should remember that the bicuspid valve is also called as mitral valve whereas the valve which is present between the right atrium and the right ventricle has three leaflets so it is a tricuspid valve so these are the major vessels okay the iota and the pulmonary trunk as you can see here these uh, these valves have three cusps okay each of these valves have three cusps and um, these valves are called as the aortic and pulmonary valves are called as semilunar valves okay so these are some of the basics and i've told cusps when i mentioned uh, some of the valves and i've told leaflets when i mentioned some of the valves so are they same or are they different they're basically the same but uh, they get different name in different uh, places for example they're called as cusps in semilunar valves and they're called as leaflets in atrioventricular valves okay so basically they're the same thing but they get different names in different uh, valves okay so in semilunar valves we call them cusps in atrioventricular valves we call them leaflets so let's see about the histological layers of valves the valves are lined by the endothelial uh, the cardiac endothelial lining and that's okay and uh, apart from that there are uh, three main histological layers uh, which are identified in the cardiac valves the first layer which you can see at the top is the a layer which is uh, rich in collagen collagenous fibers okay the central layer the middle layer is uh, full of loose connective tissue and proteoglycans okay the third layer is uh, rich in elastin and these layers actually have separate names the layer which is rich, rich in collagen is called fibrosa the layer which, in, which is rich in loose connective tissue and proteoglycans is called spongiosa. The layer which is rich in elastin is called atrialis or ventricularis depending on which side it faces. Okay, So it is very essential to know the composition and the various layers of the valves to understand the pathology of the valvular heart diseases. Okay, I'll tell you about that. So there are three common things which can happen to the valves. Okay, First of all, they can be damage to the collagen uh, so the, the, the damage to the collagen can cause stiffness of the valves this happens in certain valve heart diseases okay and we'll see about that okay uh, in my in our upcoming videos okay just try to remember that there are three basic pathologies which are happening in the valves first is damage to the collagen and the second thing is not a lot calcification and this commonly uh, uh, leads to uh, aortic stenosis okay not a lot of calcification can lead to calcific aortic stenosis and all that okay so this is the second thing which can happen and third thing is that the valves can undergo fibrosis and get thickened okay so this is the thing and fibrotic thickening is usually seen in mitral stenosis uh, which is occurring secondary to rheumatic heart disease so these are the three common pathological uh, changes which can happen in the cardiac valves 
uh, this can coexist and uh, this can present alone also and so you have to remember that three common pathological changes along with the three layers in the heart cardiac valves to understand the upcoming uh, to understand my upcoming videos okay apart from these uh, three uh, apart from these uh, uh, these uh, layers which uh, contains collagen elastin and all that uh, all the layers in the cardiac uh, valves the uh, the spongiosa the the fibrosa and all that the, all the layers will be rich in one particular cell type which is known as valvular interstitial cells okay these valvular interstitial cells are present in all the layers of the cardiac valves and these uh, basically um, synthesize the extracellular matrix in the cardiac valve and they also synthesize matrix degrading enzymes which can break down the collagen and so this is gonna uh, keep the uh, this is gonna keep everything under control it's gonna synthesize the matrix it's gonna break down the matrix and everything's gotta be under control and so and you, are, uh, you must remember that the valvular interstitial cells are the most abundant cells in the cardiac valves and they are also very important uh, in uh, in maintaining the normal structural integrity of the cardiac valves so there are certain things which can happen to the valves okay well what are the things that can happen to the valves the valves can undergo stenosis the valves can undergo insufficiency or both can coexist also okay so we'll, we'll see about individual things okay so um, before uh, before moving on to that, uh, it'll be better if you have a MacLeod with you so that you can refer to it straight away after watching this video. Okay, this is the best thing you can do to understand the basics or uh, the or the most important things you must know about the murmurs and all that. Okay, so you must have a MacLeod with you. If you don't have, it's fine. You can use Hutchinson also. It's uh, it's up to you. And if you don't have a MacLeod yet, you can check out the link in the description of this video and you can consider buying it. It's actually worth it, okay? So first, let's see about stenosis, uh, stenosis as a common thing, okay? Uh, let's consider stenosis happening in any of the valve, any of the semilunar or atrioventricular valves, okay? What happens in stenosis is basically narrowing, okay? So the valves, uh, the commissures uh, will be, uh, the, the commissures will be narrowed and the there won't be uh, adequate lumen in the valve to, uh, for the blood to flow okay so the valves will get narrow and so individual valve lesions will produce uh, different murmurs for example the mitral valve if, get, if it gets stenosed will produce diastolic murmur uh, so in this video i'm just telling you uh, if the murmur occurs during systole or diastole okay in our upcoming videos on individual cardiac valve lesions, I'll tell you exactly when the mur uh, murmur occurs. And in addition to the murmurs, there are so many other things which are happening in various cardiac lesions. Okay, like for example, the opening snap sound, splitting of A2 and uh, splitting of the S2. Okay, so I'll be explaining about that in in, in the individual cardiac valve lesion videos. So first, uh, to to, uh, to get the concepts clear i'm just telling you when the murmur occur in various heart valve lesions okay so first in mitral stenosis what happens is that there'll be a diastolic murmur now why is diastolic murmur happening in mitral stenosis that's because the mitral valve gets stenosed so blood cannot flow from the left atrium to the left ventricle freely okay because of the, because of the narrowing of the valve so during systole um, the blood from the ventricles will be pumped into the aorta that's fine but during diastole what will happen is the ventricles will relax and most of the ventricle filling during diastole as you all know is by passive filling okay the blood will passively flow from the left atrium to the left ventricle but because of aortic uh, mitral stenosis blood cannot passively flow from the left atrium to the left ventricle because of the narrowed valve so what has to happen uh, mainly is the uh, the atrial left atrial contraction okay so in case of mitral stenosis, the function of left atrial contraction uh, in ventricular filling is very necessary, okay? So the left atrium has to develop so much of pressure and pump the blood with so much of pressure through the narrow valve and this will produce the murmur during uh, the diastole, okay? That's why uh, there is a diastolic murmur in mitral stenosis. 
the same mechanism happens in tricuspid uh, stenosis okay if the tricuspid valve undergoes stenosis the same mechanism happens so in aortic stenosis what happens is that the aortic valve will get stenosed so there will be a systolic murmur if uh, okay let's see uh, let's say if the aortic valve uh, gets narrowed and the atri and the ventricle has to pump the blood uh, with so much of force during systole to overcome the to flow uh, to make the blood flow through the narrow aortic valve and when that happens uh, the systolic murmur is produced okay so during diastole there's nothing happening to, uh, in aortic stenosis during systole the blood has to flow through the narrow lumen with increased pressure and that's creating the systolic murmur okay and in pulmonary stenosis it's the same mechanism and that's why you get systolic murmur here also just try to understand that uh, um, uh, try to understand how the murmur is occurring in diastolic phase in the mitral stenosis and tricuspid stenosis and in systolic phase during aortic stenosis and pulmonary stenosis okay so this will give you a basic idea and when we cover these individual lesions in separate videos i'll clearly tell you when exactly these murmurs are happening don't worry about it right now okay so because some murmurs will be occurring during mid diastole and some will be occurring during the early systole and all this the, all these may look complicated but these are actually super simple and i'll be making it very clear in my upcoming videos okay so keep watching in insufficiency what happens is the valves are not competent enough to hold back the blood during uh, systole or when they're supposed to hold back the blood okay so the valves are not able to provide unidirectional flow of blood there's backflow of the blood uh, when uh, which is actually not supposed to happen in mitral regurgitation the mitral valves uh, are not strong enough to hold the uh, blood back inside the ventricles during ventricular systole okay so what happens is during ventricular contraction blood normally has to flow only through the aorta the atrioventricular valves that is the mitral valve right here has to close so the mitral valves are not closing here so the blood uh, when uh, the blood from the ventricles during contraction flows to the aorta as well as the some amount of backflow of um, blood into the left atrium also okay that's why you hear a murmur um, a murmur during systole systolic phase in mitral regurgitation the same mechanism happens in tricuspid regurgitation okay in aortic regurgitation what happens is that uh, during the contraction uh, the, uh, in this case the aortic valve is not competent enough okay so during uh, ventricular uh, contraction the aortic valve uh, the aortic valve uh, is open and the blood will flow into the aorta right and what happen what should happen during ventricular diastole the, aort uh, the aortic valve has to close so that the blood uh, will the blood which is which has entered the aorta will not flow back into the uh, left ventricle right but what happens is that because of the incompetence of aortic valve the blood which has entered the aorta during left ventricular contraction will enter into will come back or back uh, will flow back into the left ventricle during the vent when the ventricular has relaxed okay so what basically happens here is that the valve the, uh, the aortic valve is not able to close and prevent the backflow of blood which is present in the aorta into the left ventricle and the same mechanism happens in pulmonary regurgitation okay uh, so that's why you hear the murmur during diastole so basically how to understand which mur uh, which murmur happens when is uh, you have to correlate it with when it is uh, in which phase of uh, the thing uh, which phase of the systole or diastole or when the murmur is uh, the event is actually happening okay for example in uh, now let's see pulmonary regurgitation okay in pulmonary regurgitation what should happen uh, what happens is uh, upon contraction of the right ventricle normally the blood has to flow through the pulmonary trunk and it should not come back to the right ventricle the pulmonary valves which are present in the opening of the pulmonary trunk is not competent enough here so after the contraction of the right ventricle is over and the blood has been pumped into the pulmonary trunk the right ventricle will have to relax for its filling in the next phase right in the next for the next cardiac cycle so during that time the blood which has entered the pulmonary trunk will flow back into the right ventricle because the valves are not uh, strong enough to be uh, strong enough to prevent the backflow of blood in the right ventricle so that is why the murmur is here during diastolic phase 
uh, in pulmonary regurgitation. Okay. So there is another term which is called as functional regurgitation. Uh, in this term, uh, in this condition, the heart valves are actually normal, but regurgitation takes place. Now, how is that? That is because there are so many supporting structures which anchor the cardiac valves to the ventricular, uh, ventricular, the ventricles. Okay, the cardiac ventricles, and these structures include carotid tendine and the papillary muscles. Okay, so the papillary muscles are attached to the uh, ventricles, and from that. Some are tense cords, which are called, which are known as cord tendine, are attached to the valves. Okay, from the papillary muscles to the cardiac valves. If they are not strong enough, what will happen is that um, uh, they'll not be able to hold the mitral uh, the, the valves in the position in their intact position. So regurgitation can take place. Okay, so they become loose, or because of any other supporting structure weakness, uh, there can be regurgitation of blood back into the uh, uh, back into the previous chamber and that is uh, known as functional regurgitation okay and uh, this is a basic thing which most of you must be knowing but uh, just for completion sake I'm telling you these are the auscultatory areas okay so these are where you are supposed to hear for murmurs of the particular valuation for example if you are gonna hear murmur of aortic stenosis you have to hear it in the aortic area where you can hear it most commonly if you want to hear murmur of mitral stenosis you should hear in the mitral area okay so it's very simple actually the second right intercostal space is where you auscultate for the aortic area that area is actually called as aortic area the second left intercostal space is called as pulmonary area okay the murmur which arises from the pulmonary valve will be better here in the second left intercostal space the murmur of the tricuspid murmurs of the tricuspid area uh, can be uh, better heard. Uh, the tricuspid valve can be better heard in the tricuspid area, which is the left fourth uh, intercostal space, uh, just adjacent to the sternum, that is parasternally. Okay, and the mitral area is left fifth intercostal space in the mid clavicular line. So these are called as the auscultatory areas, and these are where you are supposed to auscultate. You're supposed to auscultate all these areas, okay? Even though, um, even though the patient has uh, mit mitral valve lesion, you should auscultate all these areas, okay? Because so many other, uh, so many valvular valve lesions can coexist. For example, a patient can have mitral regurgitation along with aortic regurgitation. So many other combinations are possible. So you you have to auscultate all these areas, okay? To get uh, to get an idea on where the exact pathology is. We came to the end of this video. In my upcoming videos, I'll make videos. Uh, I'll be talking about individual um, valvular heart diseases like mitral stenosis, mitral regurgitation, rheumatic heart disease, infective endocarditis, etc. Okay, so you uh, so make sure to hit the subscribe button uh, right now, and also if you like this video, make sure to hit the like button. And if you want me to make more videos, you can support my channel by donating on www.patreon.com/made which made simple. And please don't uh, forget to check out these merch which are designed by myself. The link is in the description as well as in the cards. So uh, we came to the end of this video. Uh, so if you watched till the end, I'm pretty sure that you got something. Uh, you got some idea on the valvular heart diseases. The basics are uh, simplified in this video. Uh, so please make sure you hit the like button right now and comment your feedback uh, in the comment section below and share this video to your friends and tell them to subscribe to Medwitch Made Simple. Thank you so much for watching. I'll see you guys in my next video.